so I'm here to talk to you about this idea of living fully. And my journey to this moment, to being able to stand here and talk to you about this, uh, started ooh, 28 years ago uh, when my parents and I uh, left Soviet Russia, which is where I grew up. Actually, my daughter will tell you I never really grew up, but I was 13. I got to 13 in Soviet Russia, and my parents and I are Jewish. If you know anything about Soviet Russia and Jews um, at that time, it was uh, a difficult life. So I grew up trying to leave, being persecuted. So finally, we got out in 1989 with 600 bucks, $200 per person, and six suitcases, two suitcases per person. Everything else was left behind. And a lot of hope, a lot of hope to get here. And so the first place we went to was a refugee settlement in Austria. It's one of the only photos we have from that time. No comments about the outfit. Yet Yes, the pants are pleated, and no, I don't have a Wesleyan t-shirt. I actually don't know where this t-shirt came from. But this is a photo of us. So we spent a couple weeks at a refugee settlement in Austria, and then we're smuggled in, because we had no documents, um, on the train through the Alps to a refugee camp in Italy, where we would then stay for three months, applying to the US, going through multiple interviews and affidavits, being vetted very, very carefully. Um, until we were lucky, we got permission to come as refugees. At the time, only about 30% of approximately half a million Russian Jews who came that year that way got in. So we were thrilled. And here we are. We're coming to the United States. And we land in the projects outside of Detroit. That's the only place we could afford to live on welfare and food stamps, very grateful to have anything, but in a mental state that I remember as just utter confusion and a lot of pain. I mean, we didn't speak any English. I mean, whatever English we spoke was detrimental. I said things like herbs and branches in eighth grade. Okay, imagine what the kids did to me, and this was one of my two outfits. So it was a, <laughs> yeah, again, I asked not, you know, not to laugh. Come on, guys. Um, it was a really, really rough time. You know, my parents were out trying to get jobs and put food on the table, and, you know, I didn't want to burden them with all my feelings, and my feelings were just dark and confused, but I also had a lot of hope, and I, I had this sense like I had to do something with this gift I was given to be in America. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be happy. The American dream is to be happy, so I'm going to be happy. And the only way that I figured out how to feel that, the only escape from like the darkness was any time I achieved something. Somewhere around middle high school, I learned enough English to like stop being a loser and fail everything because I couldn't read. And I started doing really well in school. I get all these awards and I do really well. And every time I did, there'd be this bubble of happiness. I felt great. My parents felt great. I was like, okay, this is it. This is how I'm going to be happy. I'm just going to blow one of these achievement bubbles after the other. And then Everything will be OK in my life, and I'll feel happy. So I call it, I went on a chase of the big happy. You know, I graduated at the top of my high school, got into West. Thank you, Barbara. Graduated from West with high and university honors. Here's my crying parents right there. I got a job at McKinsey. No one from Wesleyan had been admitted to the employment rungs of McKinsey in 15 years. Became a venture capitalist at the ripe age of 24. And yes, as a woman, I was a managing director. I didn't know anything about venture capital at the time, but built a career in VC. Started a publishing company with Avi because being a venture investor wasn't enough. We had to do a second job, was recruited eventually to work at Microsoft, ran a consumer team of a startup here in Boston that was very successfully acquired by PayPal. Married my Wesleyan sweetheart, Avi, class of 99. We had a beautiful daughter named Mia, who is now 12. Yes, I had her very young. You know, I did all these things. And even the stroller in this picture is like the most expensive stroller you can have, right? And I could get it because I achieved all this stuff. And the thing is, all of these things made me really proud. I still am so proud. I worked my butt off for every single one of these things. But none of them made me happy, not for more than a moment, right? I never felt this lasting sense of joy that I was after. You know, the curse and the blessing of being a human being is that we adapt. We adapt to the good and to the bad. And so, yes, I felt excited with each new achievement and that eventually the bubble would pop and I need more and more and more. And I live my life with this, like, I'll be happy when formula, right? And you're all, many of you are nodding, right? Because this isn't unique to me. How many times do you catch yourself going, OK, I'll be happy when that project you know, goes through at work. I'll be happy when I meet that person. I'll be happy when I can go on vacation. I'll be happy when I lose or gain 10 pounds, right? I live my whole life this way. But the thing is, 
the big happy wasn't coming. And it was about, um, I don't know, it was about 15 years of doing this that got me to a pretty dark place. I wasn't happy, I wasn't feeling fulfilled, and on top of all this, I felt really guilty for not feeling happy and fulfilled, because look at all that stuff I'd done. So I went searching, and I went searching into science. My father is a scientist, so I started looking at the science. Like, what would science tell me about feeling happy? And what I kept reading in one research paper after another, at first, made no sense to me. Because here was this academic research showing that there is very simple things we can do to fundamentally increase our well-being. And the number one thing I kept reading about was gratitude. And I'll be honest with you, when I first read, and there's more than 11,000 different studies that show that practicing gratitude, simply focusing on a few positive small things in your life, dramatically shifts your well-being. When I first started reading this, my reaction to it was, what a bunch of BS. To be honest, because I just suffered for 20 years. I like worked so hard to get to the happy, and this was going to work. So I set out to try it as an experiment I was sure was going to fail, and I was going to be very excited to feel like I am special. My suffering is special. This is not going to work for me. Well, here I am standing in front of you. The experiment didn't just not fail. It didn't fail spectacularly. But the thing about gratitude that blew my mind was how overwhelmingly positive and wide-reaching the effects are. So. People who practice gratitude are less stressed, less anxious, live longer, have fewer heart attacks, healthier marriages, they're better leaders at work, they're happier employees at work. I can make the slide really, really crowded, like the way you're not supposed to do, because the benefits are so wide reaching. And the thing is, being grateful, practicing gratitude actually scientifically does lead to being happier. And I started seeing this in my own life. So I talked about this experiment I set out on. Avi remembers this. I said, okay, for 30 days, I'm gonna write down three good things about my life. In fact, the corporate name for happier is good times three. That's still in our original documents. Some days it was really hard. Some days it was really easy, but I started to see a shift. And I think the biggest evidence to me was my family, Avi, my daughter, my parents, they started to see a shift. My well-being was increased, I started to notice more of those small positive things that were already there. I didn't have to do anything, I just had to notice them. My interactions with other people improved and the benefits I felt were so palpable, so tangible, I became not just passionate, like you could say obsessed about bringing them to other people and that's where Happier came from. So I left my big job at PayPal at the time. It was not a very fulfilling, but a very big job stressed my parents to an nth degree because once again, so I came to them and said, I'm starting another company. But that's where Happier came from. So we founded Happier as essentially a life appreciation platform. And we first started on mobile. We now have courses and much more, but with the very simple mission of helping millions of people learn and practice gratitude. And we now have more than 7 million moments of gratitude that have been shared and counting. And, you know, I became this like the happy lady. I was all over the press and TV, you know, as promoting this idea of focusing on these small moments in your life. And I mean, let's just pause for a second and talk about the irony of a Russian Jew starting a happiness company. I come from a country where this is smiling. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've seen that picture a lot <laughs> lately. So here I was, I had shifted a lot of positive feelings within myself. I learned to deal with stress better. I was running this company and, you know, we've now reached more than a million people with Happier. So I was helping so many people. And yet, while I was building up more of, I call it the joy bank, there was still this enormous amount of difficult emotions in me, like this pile of pain and confusion and stress and every little anxiety I'd ever felt that I'd never dealt with, because I didn't know how. I didn't come from a culture where we talked about any negative emotions. I grew up in a way that, you know, you feel something negative, you kind of bear down and you keep going. And, you know, the immigration experience was really rough. I didn't know how to talk to my parents about it. And so I always thought the way to deal with negative emotions is to run the other way. So you feel stressed out, you run towards joy. You feel pain or sad or confused. Okay, you practice gratitude. I use it like a Band-Aid. I use gratitude as this Band-Aid to put, try to put on top. But the thing is, and you guys know this, you cannot run away from a pile of negative feelings. Eventually, it spills out. Eventually, it got so big for me that 
it started to affect every area of my life. I mean, on the outside, I was the lady in the New York Times promoting gratitude, but I wasn't functioning very well. Talk about depressed or sad. It affected everything, my marriage, my relationships, my work. And so I had to go back to the drawing board. I had to go look again. And I went back to science, but I also started um, a pretty comprehensive study of Eastern disciplines of yoga and Buddhism and a lot more. And the thing that I discovered is that I had to strengthen my emotional immune system so that I could learn to be okay when things were not okay. So the emotional immune system is this concept that I use to simply describe this ability to feel, experience a negative emotion and be able to be okay during it. So we all know we have an immune system, right? So what does our immune system do when a germ enters our body? A healthy immune system doesn't go, okay, I don't wanna deal with that right now, okay. No, 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 don't talk to me about the germ, right? A healthy immune system doesn't go, okay, I'm just gonna focus on what's working in the body and this. If it did that, we would get very, very sick. The same way, if you have a healthy emotional immune system, when you feel something negative, stress or pain or confusion or just a meh feeling, it doesn't go, okay, I don't wanna feel that, let me go practice some gratitude or let me self-medicate with achievement or drugs or shopping, right? It looks at that emotion and it is able to process it. You are able to have to experience the emotion and learn to be okay. And that's the enormous discovery that I made that not only has helped me truly what I call live fully, which is two things, experience more joy in the everyday moments and learn to experience the difficult moments and be okay. And this is what I call living fully. It's truly the ability to experience all the moments in our lives, the good and the bad. And it shifted dramatically the messaging through Happier. I kicked off a whole Happier at Work program with employers and organizations where I go in and talk about this and do workshops. But it's, it's, it requires a dramatic shift, but you can achieve this with very simple practices. So how do you do this? How do you experience more joy? and improve your strength and your emotional immune system. So you can boil it down. I've boiled it down to kind of four core practices. And again, think of this as a muscle that we all have and that you can strengthen. So let's talk about the four real quick. The first one is what I call mindful awakeness. So mindful awakeness is a very simple concept, but very difficult for us modern humans to execute. It's simply the ability to be here now in this moment without leaning into the past, or into the future, right? So studies show that half the time, our minds are distracted with something that we're not doing at the moment. So half our lives, our brain is somewhere else from where we are, and yet research shows we are the happiest and most able to perform and outperform on a task at hand when we are focused on it. And I always use different examples. I have a new favorite one to use, which is Tom Brady. Here we are in Boston. Avi, this is for you. Avi's so excited I'm becoming a, a, a football fan. So I read this very long article about play-by-play play where Tom Brady was talking about the last couple minutes in the Super Bowl and what he was thinking about. And he used this term that they asked him, you know, when you had 12 seconds left and you had to throw a play and you're about to lose, like, what were you thinking? And in his answer, he basically said, well, I created my own reality. I wasn't thinking about, I have 0.02% chance of winning. I wasn't thinking, oh crap, we really screwed up to get to this point. He simply was thinking, I have 12 seconds. I gotta throw a play that'll get us over that line. He was fully, mindfully awake in that moment. That's what the practice is. So that's the first practice, is to focus the mind on whatever it is you're doing. The second is, and we've talked about a little gratitude. So I call this a gratitude zoom. Now our brains, unfortunately, are naturally conditioned to look out for the negative, right? In case like a pack of wild boars is running, it needs to protect us. Doesn't happen that often these days, but that's what our brain is set to do. So the practice of gratitude, and I call it a gratitude zoom, it's simply asking your brain to come off of the autopilot of focusing on the negative and zoom in on the small positive moments that are already there in your life. Because the thing is, that really good cup of coffee you had this morning, or that really nice interaction you had with your colleague at work, if it's in any way familiar to your brain, it doesn't register it. It's conserving its energy to focus on something big and negative. So it's like they didn't happen. So that's the practice of a gratitude zoom. It's simply asking your brain to come off the autopilot and instead focus on some small positive things that are already here. The third is what I call intentional kindness. Now we've all heard random acts of kindness, right? It's a, 
nice idea, but what I'm asking you to do is shift a little bit and think about being intentionally kind. The number one quality that people who report highest life satisfaction and well-being have in common is the strength of their social connections. And I think that intentional kindness is the best way to fuel those social connections and increase the frequency of positive interactions we have with others, which is again a huge determinant of how happy and how well we feel. Now the cool thing about kindness is that the tiniest thing, if you simply intended to be kind, can have a dramatic impact. And I can guarantee you, if you all think about your last couple days or maybe a couple weeks, You'll, you'll remember something kind, something small that someone did. Someone held the door. Someone greeted you with a smile. Someone checked in on you when you really needed it. A small act makes an enormous difference. And they've done research, which I find amazing, that kind interactions between friends, family, colleagues, and strangers in a coffee shop or in a subway all have the same positive effect, both on the person doing the kind act, serotonin is released, as well as on the person who's on the receiving end. And now research is showing that even observing a kind interaction makes it more likely that you will do something kind later. So that's a third. And the fourth is what I call the bigger why. Now, as human beings, it's very hard for us to live well, to live fully, if we don't have a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning in our lives. And one of the most important ways that this bigger why helps us is during times of stress or pain or tragedy, because it allows us to focus on something bigger than ourselves, right? And the cool thing is that it's not like some things have meaning and some things don't. You can infuse, meaning comes from us. And the best um, story that I have about this that really stuck with me, they did a study of janitors in a hospital. And janitors performing the same amount, the same kind of work. And some were very satisfied with their work and some were very dissatisfied. So they started talking to them and they would ask them, please tell me what you do. The janitors that were very satisfied with their jobs talked about the why. They said, I help patients heal. They said, I help families who come to visit sick ones feel better. The janitors who had low job satisfaction said, I clean the floors, I clean the windows, I rearrange the chairs, they talked about the what. So focusing on the why within any job, right? These are janitors, they infuse their jobs with meaning. And so we all have the opportunity to do it. Now meaning doesn't have to come from work, it can come from something that you're creating, it can come from taking care of someone, but it's not an arbitrary quality, it's something that comes from us. So these are the four practices for experiencing more joy within everyday moments and strengthening your emotional immune system so you can be okay when things are not okay. And you know, I do this for a living and I give a lot of speeches and talks and there's always some skepticism, right? And I get it, I used to be, I have a section in my talk usually it says confessions of a happiness skeptic. I get it, I was a skeptic too. And But people say things like, I'm really busy. I'll, I get it, it's really smart, I should do it, but I'm really busy or I don't know, isn't it kind of selfish to like do all these things for my own well-being? And, I wanna leave you kind of with this thought, and this is my response to this, is think of someone right now that you really, really care about. Maybe it's someone you love, like I always think of my daughter Mia or daughter Mia, or maybe it's someone at work that you really care about, but think of someone you really care about. And if I asked you, what kind of life do you want that person to have? I think all of us in some amount of words would say we want them to be happy. We want them to have meaning. We want them to be with people they love, right? But the thing is, you can't give to others what you don't have yourself, right? So practicing these things we talked about is not just something great that you can do for yourself. It's, I think, the greatest gift that we can give to people that we love and care about. And I wanna leave you with this, and to carry this to yourself and your communities, your work and people you care about, and that's this. Life is made of moments, many, many, many moments. I think the latest estimate I saw is 64 billion moments in a lifetime, so that's many moments. But we all have the ability, ourselves, and the ability to help others, and I was thinking about this when you were talking about City Year, that that's what the young people are doing. We can also do this for others where we can live fully, and that's what it means to live fully.